Happy Friday, everybody, here on uh, St. Patrick's Eve uh, COPD Navigator Live, uh, our weekly look into the world of COPD. My name is Mike Hess. I'm a respiratory therapist and COPD educator. Glad you were able to take out some of your time this week to join me uh, and join us on our little adventure into the world of COPD. Hope everybody's having a great week. Um, we've had some wacky snow here in Michigan. Uh, hope uh, other people are doing a little bit better. I understand uh, out east is having a little bit of weather problems also. Uh, but hopefully now that we're just past the Ides of March and getting into uh, a couple of days away from springtime, uh, hopefully we will start seeing a little bit more improvement and a little bit less craziness in the weather. Along with uh, this being uh, St. Patrick's Day Eve, a uh, very exciting day for a lot of people who, uh, let's say, want to have some social activities uh, to celebrate good old St. Patrick. Uh, this is also Pulmonary Rehabilitation Week. This is a week that where we celebrate a lot of our pulmonary rehabilitation uh, uh, professionals uh, who help a lot of people in the COPD community uh, and with other chronic lung diseases, pulmonary fibrosis, a lot of that other stuff, uh, help them live a little bit more uh, engaged lives, help you learn how to do better exercises, help you learn uh, all that kind of stuff. Unfortunately, a lot of people still uh, don't have access to a lot of pulmonary rehabilitation programs. Um, that's something we're really working on to change this week uh, in our uh, uh, my professional association, the American Association for Respiratory Care. Uh, we had an update about some of the uh, funding, uh, the reimbursement issues that pulmonary rehabs have been struggling with and what uh, various groups are doing to try to fix that to bring this uh, excellent program uh, to, uh, to more of the masses. Uh, along those lines, our first news of uh, our first bit of news in the COPD world this week, and if you're new to the program, what we like to do is have a little bit of an introduction with some of the latest news features uh, in the world of COPD, uh, and then we get into our uh, weekly topic, which this week is uh, talking about non-invasive ventilation. Uh, and then toward the end of the program, we do uh, reserve some time for questions and answers. So if you do have anything that's on your mind, whether it has to do with pulmonary rehabilitation, uh, whether it has to do with non-invasive ventilation, or whether it has to do with something completely different, uh, please make sure you're getting those questions into uh, whichever side of the screen that your question mark is on, your question box or on your comment box, whatever uh, you want to call it, uh, and get those in. We'll make sure we get those addressed toward the end of the program here. Uh, jumping back to pulmonary rehabilitation, um, there is, uh, along, uh, during this week, there was an excellent, um, I guess they call it a peer-to-peer -peer session on this website called MD Magazine that focuses a on physicians, on the uh, where well. they had a couple of our of uh, heavy hitters in the COPD community, such as Dr. Barbara Young, who's a primary right. care uh, uh, physician, well, and does a lot of work trying to improve uh, the treatment of COPD in the primary care well, it was uh, setting, for uh, like myself. The for uh, a and uh, Dr. We Byron Tomashaw, who is the chair of the board of directors for the COPD Foundation, spoke with a couple other panel members about some the struggles that people have, uh, people face trying to get into pulmonary rehabilitation, trying to find uh, better access to it, uh, talking about how in a place, I believe it's San Antonio, was specifically mentioned, uh, a place with millions of residents, there are precisely two pulmonary rehabilitation programs, and one of them is through the VA, so uh, that's uh, specific to our veterans, which means that there's one program in all of that, uh, that particular area to service the needs of the COPD population. On, Obviously, on. that is you not enough. And we and see that even in our major cities and uh, particularly uh, troublesome like in um, more rural areas that already have access, uh, uh, access difficulties so trying to get into various uh, health care programs. Uh, we definitely that's need to see uh, improvement in those areas, and that's what we're working on with these kind of programs to definitely get the word out about how many people struggle with access to that. So I encourage everybody to follow that link down there and check out that video for yourselves. So there definitely are providers, clinicians, physicians, respiratory therapists who are trying to advocate for um, better exercise for everybody else. So why is exercise so important? Well, as it happens, uh, there was our second piece of news this week uh, comes out from the, uh, um, what's it called, Biomed Central. 
uh, public health issue. This is a, a peer-reviewed open access journal. Uh, this particular article talked about the association of total and type-specific physical activity uh, with mortality in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. What they did for this uh, particular uh, journal article was they took a look at a little over 2,000 uh, people with COPD over in England uh, and asked them about their, their exercise habits for uh, and followed them for about eight years, about eight and a half years. So this was a pretty long-term study. On what they found was that people who had uh, the, the concept of a, of a um, their, their conclusion was that there was a, what we call a, a uh, what do we call it, a dose, uh, a dose response relationship where the more exercise you got the more likely you were to have the better health outcomes but they also found that for people with with COPD even um, relatively low levels of exercise uh, were still able to re, uh, improve uh, some of their quality of life features um, they were uh, able to reduce some of the all-cause mortality which means people were living longer um, and so uh, obviously exercise is a big benefit to a lot of people. Uh, what they found was uh, using the cutoff of 150 minutes of moderate physical activity, uh, which is uh, things like brisk walking, dancing, um, playing, with, uh, playing with kids, playing with children, uh, or 75 minutes of vigorous physical activity, which are things like running, uh, swimming, shoveling, hopefully we don't have to do too much more of that, but the, the more strenuous activity, if you did 75 minutes of that per week, 150 minutes of the less strenuous activity or a, a, a equivalent combination of the two, um, that's what they consider the, the guideline for um, uh, optimal exercise. And people who hit that target had excellent outcomes when it came to uh, cardiovascular disease mortality, all that kind of stuff, uh, as well as some of the respiratory symptoms. Uh, people who came close to that maybe had 75 minutes of the vigorous stuff, kind of a step down from that, that optimal level. All right, so apparently that video didn't stop playing like it was supposed to, which is unfortunate because uh, now I'm not quite sure how to stop it. Uh, let's see. Every time I think I have the tech figured out, we had to run into another issue. Uh, so we are going to back up for a second and we're just going to stop that like that. So basically the upshot was, um, we'll start over from the beginning here. Um, this medical, why are we talking about uh, exercise being so important? Well, it turns out that uh, this other piece of news that we have this week uh, comes straight from um, the uh, an English study uh, from the uh, published in the Biomed Central uh, Public Health Peer Reviewed Open Access Journal, uh, where we talk about uh, people who have exercise. Uh, people who do exercise have uh, what we call a dose response relationship where the essentially the more exercise you get the uh, better your results are they took a limit of about 150 minutes of moderate level activity which are things like uh, walking your dog um, at a brisk pace uh, things like dancing things like playing with grandkids that sort of thing and also took a look at uh, 75 minutes of more strenuous activity uh, which is things like swimming or uh, running jogging, um, shoveling. Hopefully we don't have to do too much more of that uh, these days, but uh, it does happen. Uh, and if you hit the level of either 75 minutes a week of that more strenuous stuff or 150 minutes of the less strenuous stuff or a combination thereof, we found that you had uh, improvements in cardiovascular outcomes. You tended, people tended to live longer, didn't die from cardiovascular diseases, had better respiratory outcomes, uh, were able to have a little bit better disease tolerance, all that kind of stuff. Um, for people who had uh, didn't quite hit that target but were still getting a fair amount of exercise, maybe they were instead of 75 minutes of strenuous activity, they were getting 75 minutes of the moderate activity. Um, they still found improvements, not quite to the level of uh, the higher, the higher, the target um, exercise levels, uh, but they did still have uh, some improvements on that. So uh, basically any bit of exercise, even le at levels that weren't necessarily thought to be super beneficial, uh, have been found to be beneficial for people with, uh, with COPD. 
Uh, of course, the more you get, the more the better things are, though. So next up, we're actually going to have a new feature here, uh, a little bit of a product review. Uh, this is something that I haven't really done before. I should point out that I don't uh, get reimbursed by the company or anything like that for these product reviews. Uh, these are things that come up in the course of our uh, conversations throughout the various uh, uh, group chats and things like that. Uh, again, for those of you who are new to the program, we do have a Facebook group linked to COPD Navigator, uh, where you can go to facebook.com slash group slash COPD Navigator or look for our main site uh, or our main Facebook page uh, and participate there. Uh, but we have had a lot of people talking about pulse oximetries, the little uh, pulse oximeters, the little uh, devices that put you put on the end of your finger, and they, uh, through the magic of infrared technology and some uh, some other science, uh, manage to tell you exactly how much blood is or how much oxygen is floating through your bloodstream. Uh, this device uh, is called the ISPO2. SPO2 is kind of a, a technical term for pulse oximetry. Uh, saturation, pulse, oxygen, O2, all that kind of stuff. Uh, this is made by the Massimo company. Again, I'm not uh, affiliated with them in any way. Uh, this is a device I, I picked to do this one first because I was able to get it through uh, my Flex. We have an online store that is connected to our flexible spending accounts, and I was able to get it pretty easily. And I wanted to see um, how some of these different devices are out there. We talk about uh, pulse oximetry a lot in uh, COPD. And we do tend to encourage people to get these pulse oximeters, um, but we also tend to see that there are a lot of uh, kind of garbage devices out there right now that are relatively low cost, but also relatively low quality. A lot of these devices come over from uh, from China or from other comp uh, from other uh, uh, relatively low cost manufacturing countries. Uh, and they are of some questionable value. A lot of people say, well, I get my device and uh, it matches up really well with, um, with uh, my doctor's device when I go in and check it out and compare the two. Uh, and that normally happens. These devices in theory are fairly simple. And when, things, when you're at rest, when you don't put a lot of demands on, uh, on the device, then they record pretty easily. Um, however, of course, when you're concerned about your ox oxygen are times when you are doing things like exercise, uh, when you're having an exacerbation, and when you are having a low oxygen state. And those are the kinds of conditions where some of these devices fall a little short, and unfortunately, you kind of get what you pay for. So this device um, is fairly straightforward. It has the finger clip, the traditional finger clip, uh, a technology module. Uh, and then it also connects to your phone. I happen to have an Android phone. This is available for either Android or Apple, the, the iOS type devices. And what this does is it gives you a nice readout. You can see I'm saturating pretty well right now. It also gives you uh, some idea of your heart rate. Um, and this number down here gives an idea of, uh, this is called your perfusion index. This gives you an idea of how well um, the device is actually re registering your pulse. And the higher the number, the better, of course. Um, in this case, uh, I haven't really been able to get much above five. I was trying to do a little bit of research to find out exactly what a good number is. I found that the maximum number is 20, uh, but I haven't been able to obtain that just yet. Uh, when I first came in this morning, my fingers were a little bit cold, uh, and I found that uh, I was having a lot of trouble getting that number, that uh, perfusion index, over about two. Um, because when your fingers are cold, the uh, vessels contract and uh, you don't have as much blood for it to monitor. Uh, so, of course, that's, that's one thing that a lot of the lower cost devices don't measure. Uh, in addition, probably the most important thing is this little waveform down here. This is where you know that you're actually getting a good reading. These devices, uh, any device on the market is basically designed to give you a reading no matter what. It knows that people want a number, so it will give you a number. But is that number accurate? You can see, and we're going to try and get it a little bit close to the screen here and see if maybe we can focus that in a little bit better. Uh, I guess the autofocus isn't really working very well, but we can see, uh, there we go. We can see that when I start to move my finger, that waveform kind of goes in the garbage a little bit. 
This particular device is designed to be able to see through that garbage a little bit better. And if I was actually desaturating, it would be able to pick that up a little bit more. We did see that the, the uh, perfusion index dropped a little bit. Uh, okay, it's working on coming back up as my finger gets still again. But you can see you can almost, you can still have a general idea of what the waveform is. Um, you're getting, still getting pretty good reading uh, from this device. Now, let's see. And, um, so what we see from this, this is basically a professional level device that you can obtain without a prescription. Um, this technology is pre what's present in a lot of the devices that you would use in the hospital or in clinics or things like that. Um, but what they do is they, they can use the same technology, but they don't do the exhaustive testing through the FDA uh, that a lot of the actual medical devices do. Uh, in addition, this is, as I said, compatible with uh, Android or iOS devices made by Apple. Uh, that waveform monitor is very important. We want to make sure when you select a device, you're going to want to get something that can actually give you some feedback about the quality of the data that you're getting so that you know you can make a good decision. Uh, and the downside to this particular device is it is pretty expensive. This is kind of the, this is the Cadillac of pulse oxes, basically. Um, they do have one that you can actually, that is actually wireless. It's got a Bluetooth thing and will connect to your phone or your tablet, what have you. Um, that one we're actually looking at getting for the clinic. Uh, it just hasn't come in yet, so I haven't been able to take a look at that. But again, uses the same technology, uses basically the same kind of, uh, of features. Um, the, uh, the good news is these kind of devices are available uh, for those of you still in the workforce. A lot of places offer a flexible spending account where you can put away some pre-tax dollars to spend on health care. Uh, these are considered a device that's reimbursable through that. Um, so that's, uh, that could be an option for some people. And there are some prescription devices out there. Um, it can be tricky to get those covered sometimes, but if there is a particular medical benefit and you get your doctor write a prescription for it, uh, you can get that same, uh, that same coverage. Uh, I saw Valerie was asking, where would we buy one? Uh, the, this particular device, as I said, came from uh, um, an online store called, I believe it was FSA store or FSA shop.com that's designed to be used with uh, flexible spending accounts. Um, I have seen similar devices on uh, this particular uh, one, I think is also on Amazon. Uh, you can usually get them through a durable medical equipment provider. You can get them in a lot of places. Uh, now, again, this, this can be kind of cost prohibitive for a lot of people. This is, as I said, the Cadillac model uh, that I was really only able to get because I was able to use some of my flex plan money. Uh, I had a bunch of it sitting over, uh, carried over from uh, uh, those of you who may have been watching for a long time. I uh, remember I had braces up until a few months back. I had some uh, carryover from that. Um, but for a lot of people, this is a little bit out of the budget. Uh, there is a lower cost version from another company called Nonin that I actually, uh, that we are also ordering, uh, that I'm going to be reviewing as soon as that comes in too. That one runs about 70 bucks. Uh, doesn't have quite as many bells and whistles. Doesn't connect to the phone as easily, uh, at least according to their, uh, their product materials. But I do look forward to evaluating that and making, doing kind of an apples to apples comparison. What I will say, when you're buying a pulse oximeter, make sure you're getting one that, uh, you make sure that you're contemplating that you get what you pay for. You probably want to shy away from some of those cheap $20, $30 ones because um, they may work very well when you're at rest and everything is calm and there aren't any problems. But when things are starting to go wrong, you don't necessarily want to put your, uh, either your, your symptoms or your, your quality of life <clears throat> excuse me, in the hands of a $20 gizmo that uh, came out of a sweatshop somewhere. So something to consider as you're, uh, as you're doing your shopping. Uh, will Medicare cover a good one? Uh, in many cases they will. Again, sometimes the reimbursement can be tricky if you get a prescription for one. Um, they can uh, usually you can get some, uh, some coverage from that through your durable medical equipment uh, provision. Uh, sometimes it does vary by region. Uh, I don't believe there is a national coverage determination for that, so it's usually left up to the, the local coverage, uh, which can vary from region to region throughout the country. Um, so my, my best advice is if you're looking for a device like this, try to get a hold of, uh, and you don't have the, the flex, you want to go through Medicare, um, contact one of your durable medical equipment providers in the area. Uh, you may have one for, uh, maybe you also already use a nebulizer or what's where you get your oxygen equipment or what have you. 
uh, but find one that's got a good reputation and say, what do I need to get a pulse oximeter, a high quality pulse oximeter, uh, so that I can take care of myself a little bit better. And they should be able to work with you and tell you exactly what kind of paperwork you need from your provider uh, and exactly what kind of cost you're looking at after co-pays and all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, so that uh, that is our first uh, product analysis, product evaluation. That's going to be something that will pop up uh, from time to time, uh, just so that we can, uh, so that you can have a better idea of what kind of what some of the equipment out there is, uh, and how you can best spend your healthcare dollar, whether it's with. Um, co-pays, whether it's out of pocket, what have you. Um, again, I will point out that I have no affiliation with any of these companies. Uh, I'm not provided any of the equipment. Uh, and uh, should that change, I will definitely let you know because I want this to be as unbiased as possible. I want this to be information that you can rely on uh, to make uh, the best decisions for your own care. So that takes us into our topic of the day, which today is uh, what's new with NIV, non-invasive ventilation. Uh, a lot of people may be familiar with the concept of um, non-invasive stuff uh, because a lot of people with COPD also are struck with sleep apnea. This is a thing that I struggled with for a long time that was uh, due to my weight. Uh, and then I was able to lose some weight, was able to uh, not worry about the sleep apnea so much anymore. Uh, but this is uh, the most basic form of non-invasive uh, gas therapy. Uh, it's called CPAP or continuous positive airway pressure. And what that is, what CPAP is, is basically um, keeping a little bit higher level of pressure inside of your lungs so that the structures don't collapse. Uh, this is also used sometimes in the hospital when people have uh, um, hypoxia that doesn't respond to um, uh, oxygen, just plain old oxygen therapy because a lot of times when you have somebody who has low oxygen levels and the oxygen isn't helping, uh, you need to get more of those lung units into the game, those, uh, those alveoli, and CPAP is a way that can help with that. Uh, so you're basically, as you can see, you're at normal breathing, you kind of go all the way down to what we call ambient pressure or atmospheric pressure. Uh, you take your breath in, things kind of go up a little bit, and you go back down. With CPAP, you're basically moving your baseline up uh, anywhere from five centimeters of water pressure all the way up to usually maybe 18 or 20. Uh, and those help keep the structures open, those help keep the airways open, and so on and so forth. Now, when you add another level on top of that, you go into um, what is commonly called BiPAP, but I try to avoid using that because that is, actually is a registered trademark. And what should be more commonly called non-invasive ventilation uh, is where you actually have a second pressure level on top of that. You have one level of pressure that's keeping your lungs open, and then you have another level of pressure that is pushing more gas into your lungs. Uh, the way, reason we do that, there are a couple of reasons we do that, first of all. Um, we want to help people who can't take a deep enough breath on their own. Sometimes it's because you're having a COPD exacerbation or you're a little bit too fluid overloaded if you have some of that congestive heart failure um, or you have a neuromuscular disease and you're not able to take in a deep enough breath. Uh, there can be a lot of reasons for that, but basically what we're doing with this non-invasive ventilation is uh, helping you uh, exchange more gas in and out of your lungs. Um, we do sometimes use a uh, BiPAP or non-invasive ventilation for sleep, but in the setting of COPD, uh, we tend to do it for uh, ventilatory um, assistance. And one of the most common ways to do that is with this device uh, called the Trilogy Non-Invasive Ventilator. This is um, one of a couple of different devices on the market. I use this one as an example. Again, not affiliated with the company, but I use this as an example because this is one that has um, uh, been uh, relatively broadly studied, uh, particularly in the COPD uh, population. Uh, in particular, there was a study a couple years ago uh, that looked at, uh, I think it was about 400 people who had had at least two exacerbations that required them to go into the hospital uh, in the last year. Uh, they were able to, uh, when they came home out of the hospital, uh, they received uh, some oxygen therapy, they received one of these Trilogy ventilators, uh, and they received a little bit more instruction here and there. Uh, and over the next 12 months, they were able to cut that rate of readmissions, uh, almost wipe it out completely. They cut the rate by about 98%. Uh, so almost everybody that got one of these ventilators was able to stay out of the hospital uh, for at least 12 months. Now, how does that work? How, how does... Uh, you know, if, if we have this magic bullet why, of, of non-invasive ventilation, why are we doing that with more people? 
Uh, well, we have to look at uh, what the Trilogy does and what similar ventilators actually do. Uh, something a little bit more complex than your basic CPAP or uh, bi-level type of ventilation. With those kind of modes, basically what, you're, what we usually do is we have a fixed level of pressure. Uh, when I was on CPAP for my sleep apnea, I had a setting of 8 centimeters of water pressure, which means that there was a constant flow that was pressurizing my respiratory system to 8 centimeters of water pressure. The, the equivalent, if you had a, a column of water that was 8 centimeters tall, that's how much extra pressure was on there. When we add the second level for the, the BiPAP or the, the non-invasive ventilation, we add another fixed level of pressure over that. A lot of times we'll start at, for example, 12 over 8, uh, where we'll have, it, we'll have the machine set so that when you inhale, we give you 12 centimeters of water pressure. When you exhale, it's down to 8 to help keep everything open. What the Trilogy does is, let's see if I have a picture for that. I was trying to do some, some of this stuff beforehand, but uh, obviously I haven't quite figured out all the tech. Uh, what the Trilogy does is actually a little bit different. What we The Trilogy has a mode called AVAPS, which basically modifies the pressure setting uh, to target a particular tidal volume. Uh, when, when we have pressure ventilation, it's very sensitive to the condition uh, of your lungs. If your resistance changes or anything like that, the delivered volume will change too. And I know this is getting a little bit into the weeds, a little bit techie clinical kind of stuff, uh, but it's important to be able to, to uh, understand, at least at a, at a simple level, uh, the difference between these kind of ventilators. And so what this means is uh, if there's anything that changes to your lungs and we don't adjust that pressure level, then that's going to fit, that's going to mess with the amount of gas that's actually getting into your lungs and then back out. What the Trilogy does with this AVAPS mode is it's actually able to sense those changes in that tidal volume, what we'll call that tidal volume, that the amount of air that you're breathing in and out, uh, and make changes in its own settings uh, so that um, you're basically, as it was described to me one time, you're basically getting the right pressure at the right time. Uh, this is, a, a, in theory, and, and what a lot of the, uh, the evidence has been pointing out at, uh, this is a more comfortable way to, uh, to receive this kind of ventilation. Um, it's a little bit better targeted toward uh, what, your, what your needs actually are, rather than what uh, we test them one time, and then that's what you get from now on. Um, and uh, it works very well. As I said, we're able to, uh, some other studies haven't necessarily shown that uh, almost the elimination of, um, of uh, exacerbations, um, but they have been able, pretty much every study that's out there has been able to show either a reduction in healthcare expenditures, which is one measure of figuring out how much uh, you're either going to the doctor, or going to the ER, all that kind of stuff, um, uh, improvements in quality of life, uh, or reductions in, uh, in exacerbation. So being able to have this kind of uh, smart ventilation, so to speak, where it's targeting your needs a little bit better, uh, is really a game changer uh, with these kinds of devices. Uh, the newest mode with this is uh, this AVAPS, it's kind of an auto titrating mode, where in addition to um, adjusting the inspiratory pressure uh, so that you get the right amount of gas at the right time, it will actually also uh, adjust the, uh, that expiratory pressure, that part that's keeping your, your lungs open. And what that does is it can it realizes that there may be certain parts of the day, particularly in the early morning, that you need a little bit more pressure to help open up the lungs and get, get them into the game for the day. But then as you, maybe you're sitting there having your coffee or having something on, on your, uh, on your uh, excuse me, while you're still using your, your Trilogy machine, uh, maybe things are a little bit more open and that pressure is just kind of high and it's a little bit uncomfortable. The machine can sense that it's getting you enough, uh, um, uh, enough pr uh, pressure in there. It's keeping your lungs open uh, and it will actually reduce that pressure. Uh, when we reduce the expiratory pressure, we also tend to reduce the inspiratory pressure because it's really the difference between the two that's pushing that gas in. Uh, and so the whole thing basically makes it more comfortable for you. Um, so the bottom line here, again, I know we kind of got into the weeds a little bit, a little bit technical, but the bottom line here is that this is an adaptive ventilator that doesn't require any kind of breathing tube or anything like that. This is something you can use in the home. 
This is something you can use while you sleep. This is something you can use at rest. Uh, this is something that you can use day to day uh, to help keep your lungs in as best shape as, as you possibly can. Uh, it does tend to reduce the amount of exacerbations people have. It does tend to reduce the, um, uh, the amount of uh, what we call unscheduled encounters. Uh, your urgent care visits, your ER visits, that sort of thing tends to reduce those. And it does tend to improve the quality of life, even some exercise tolerance stuff here and there. Uh, so this is uh, a relatively advanced mode of ventilation, but this is something that is um, starting to become the, the standard of care and something that is available through a lot of places. Um, again, this is going to be something that uh, is going to require a little bit of testing, a little bit of paperwork on the part, and a little bit of coordination on the part uh, between your, your provider's office and your durable medical equipment provider. Um, there is a fair amount of, of stuff that needs to get into place in order for you to qualify for one of these devices, uh, but they are covered under, um, to one degree or another, they are covered under certain uh, Medicare uh, criteria. So. Um, if you are somebody who is having a lot of exacerbations or you're just having a lot of breathing issues and you feel that medications aren't doing enough uh, to help that, talk to your provider about going on to one of these, uh, these alternative therapies. Um, usually people know what you're talking about if you talk about the Trilogy, uh, but you can also use the more general term, the non-invasive ventilation, uh, and talk to them about that. More people are candidates than they realize, and more people are being identified as candidates every day as the, uh, the research on this continues to mature. Now, of course, it's all well and good for when you are at rest, um, but of course, a lot of people, we talked about pulmonary rehab a little bit earlier, a lot of people have trouble with um, their breathing while they're doing activity. It feels like you can't get enough air in. Uh, we know with COPD, we have that air trapping concept and we have that idea when uh, stale air gets stuck in your chest uh, and you can't, get fr you can't get it out, so you can't get fresh air in. Uh, and so what are you gonna do for that uh, condition? What do you do uh, for exercise support? Fortunately, there is a relatively new device out there now. Uh, has up until recently called, been called the NIOF. Uh, in doing some of the prep work here, I discovered that the, the company Breathe Technology, again, not affiliated with them, uh, seems to have changed the name to Life 2000, uh, but uh, the concept is still the same. This is a similar idea to the Trilogy. It's a non-invasive ventilator, uh, but it's far more, uh, well, it, it's a bit more portable uh, depending on exactly the, the use that you're going to have it with. Basically, what we have here, uh, we can see on the screen here, we have this small device that's listed as a NIOV on this, this screen. This was from the uh, COPD Foundation Journal. Uh, we see that uh, this NIOV ventilator kind of sits, rides on your belt uh, or in a little carry strap, that sort of thing. Uh, kind of control. That's the, the controller device that is then also attached to a compressor, which is not shown in this picture. Um, but then uh, the whole thing is set up to basically a giant nasal cannula that uh, goes up to your nose and uh, um, interfaces there. And the whole concept to this is it provides you that non-invasive ventilation, gives you that ventilatory support uh, while you're exercising. Obviously, this is uh, the, the Trilogy is a great device, but it's not very portable. It does run on batteries and that sort of thing, but it's hard to carry that lunch pail around with you all the time. Uh, this device you can plug up to a 50 foot uh, extension tubing uh, and get that pressure into your uh, when you take a breath and get that pressure, uh, that respiratory support so that you can take a deeper breath, you can move more air uh, and you can have a little bit more effective ventilation. Oh, I'd definitely be more active. Uh, here we have uh, if I had the ventilator uh, probably some sound on this clip also. I'd be able to do more things. I wouldn't be as exhausted. But you can see. I, I don't even feel any exhaustion at all using it. So allow me to do the things that I haven't been able to do for years to get out and walk, to play with my grandchildren, um, to go shopping, and not have to come home in a half an hour because I was
All right, yes, I clicked the wrong button there. So we see that um, on this graphic here, this is how the NIAV is working. Um, the gas here, the patient volume listing, is um, what you're breathing in and out. And then the device itself gives you a bit on top of that. That's what's listed as the volume output. And then the way the, the cannula device is designed, that, those big nasal pillows, uh, is that they're designed in such a way so that they have a slit in there that as the gas is being pumped through there, it actually can suck in air from the atmosphere and give you even more volume. It's called air entrainment. Uh, this is how certain respiratory masks work, uh, oxygen masks and that sort of thing. Uh, but this is also the uh, um, how the uh, um, this NIAV or Breathe 2000 works. Uh, it gives you a whole bunch of extra air. Uh, and uh, this, this is what allows it to actually be plugged into, for example, a, a tank of uh, compressed oxygen. Uh, or use that compressor and give it a little bit more battery life. Um, but this is how that actually can uh, support your respiratory, um, your respiratory efforts, help you take in more air, and improve your exercise tolerance. This, the data on this one um, is a little less obvious. It's a, it's a new device, so it's, uh, the, the data is still a little bit preliminary, um, but it's very promising. A few of the studies that came out, there was one that came out of CHEST actually a couple of years ago now, one of the first big studies uh, published by a gentleman by the name of Brian Carlin, who is uh, another one of our pillars of, uh, of COPD out in the Pittsburgh area. Uh, found that people who were using the, the NIAV, then called the NIAV device, now the Breathe 2000, a Life 2000, um, actually had, uh, were able to reduce their COPD assessment scores, those CAT scores, uh, by about half. Uh, the CAT score is a 40 point scale, so it goes from zero to 40 to figure out the different areas uh, where your symptoms are impacting you, and that overall score dropped in half. Uh, some other studies that were uh, won by a, a, a lady by the name of Chris Garvey, another fantastic pulmonary rehab specialist, trying to salute some of our pulmonary rehab people. Um, we're able to find uh, that their six minute walk, people's six minute walk scores were improved. Uh, and the, uh, another big study found that uh, the end result of, uh, after a course of pulmonary rehabilitation, uh, the mean, the average amount of time that somebody was able to uh, exercise increased significantly more for those people who were using the, the NIAV device uh, as compared to people who were just using uh, nothing at all or, or plain oxygen. So we see that uh, the NIAV is able to support a lot of people in a lot of different ways uh, as they develop their um, uh, their exercise and their pulmonary rehabilitation programs. It's able to support a lot of uh, exercise enhancements, increase your exercise tolerance, uh, and it's able to make a big difference in your quality of life. And that's kind of a common theme with these uh, with these non-invasive ventilation devices. Uh, they are definitely out there to uh, help you breathe a little bit easier, no pun intended. Uh, but they're able to help you take a deeper breath, a more effective breath, move that air in and out of your lungs a little bit better, uh, and um, it, like I said, improve your quality of life and improve your uh, uh, symptom tolerance. So uh, we see that there's a lot of stuff uh, on the horizon right now. Uh, some of this stuff is still a little bit early in the uh, the analysis phase, the research phase. Uh, some of these things have only been on the market for a couple of years, but they are incredibly promising. Uh, and uh, um, uh, oh, I should also mention the uh, the NIAV device. Uh, it's called the uh, the Breathe 2000 nowadays. Uh, let's see, I'll throw it back up there. Um, the NIAV, or, uh, had been called the NIAV up until, uh, it can't be that, that long ago, because I was just uh, looking at this not, not terribly long ago at all, um, but also called the uh, Life 2000 these days. It looks like they're in the midst of a little bit of a rebranding. Um, so uh, these devices are out there. Uh, they are being reimbursed uh, with a f uh, jumping through a few hoops, but they are being reimbursed by Medicare, Medicaid, a lot of private payers. Uh, if you have the right diagnosis code, if you have the right kind of uh, the right set of symptoms and that sort of thing, um, they are out there. They are available, uh, and they are making a big difference for a lot of people's lives. So especially as we're talking about pulmonary rehabilitation and we get into talking about exercise tolerance, uh, be sure that uh, if you are having um, issues with um, uh, your symptoms that aren't being managed uh, as well as you might hope with uh, medications and, and all that. Uh, talk to them about some of these non-invasive options because you might be pleasantly surprised at uh, how effective they can be. 
And of course, uh, stay tuned on the horizon uh, to see what else is out there uh, as we get into some of these non pharmaceutical based therapies and uh, start looking at how we can actually help people uh, physically breathe a little bit easier uh, without um, without throwing uh, even more inhalers at them. So that kind of wraps up what we're looking at for what's new in the non-invasive world. I uh, apologize again for some of those tech glitches there. I haven't quite figured out all the ins and outs of the software, so that's why we had a little bit of that crosstalk. Um, next time, my next challenge is going to be to figure out how to add some videos to the to the feed here without adding the sound feature. Uh, but uh, hopefully, we'll get that locked down before too long. Uh, still a learning experience with all this stuff. Um, what's been kind of fun. Um, for those of you, again, maybe new to the program, we've been doing this for about a little over a year now and to the point where um, uh, my uh, Facebook, it, it keeps popping up those on these days and every Thursday, um, it keeps uh, uh, popping up with, uh, with ones from last year when we were doing these on Wednesdays. So um, that's been kind of fun to see how far things have come. But of course, uh, the more bells and whistles we try to add, the more uh, uh, things that can go wrong. But I uh, do apologize for that, but uh, hopefully um, answered some questions about your uh, your non-invasive ventilation uh, concerns and all that stuff. Uh, this time we definitely have some time available for questions and answers, so I encourage everybody to get some questions typed in there. Um, and uh, whether they have to do with non-invasive ventilation, whether they have to do with uh, pulmonary rehab, uh, pulmonary rehab week, whether they have to do with medications, whatever is on your mind uh, for COPD, this is your time. Uh, this is time to get uh, some uh, objective, uh, as evidence-based as possible answers uh, for whatever is bothering you right uh, right today. Uh, so as we wait for a couple of questions to come out there, I do want to go ahead and say hello to a lot of the people who have uh, stopped by to visit today. Uh, as we're getting ready for St. Patrick's Day, Jim and Mary Nelson checking in from... Uh, well, either Arizona or Colorado, it just depends on uh, where they are. They're kind of jet setters. If uh, you're not familiar with Jim and Mary, a uh, longtime uh, uh, friends of Navigator and uh, incredible advocates for the COPD community. Um, also saw Janice Shed Cotton out there, uh, also one of our uh, vocal advocates out there. Uh, saw a couple, of, see a couple of new names passing through the uh, the uh, feed here. Appreciate everybody stopping in uh, and saying hello, spending some of your Friday with us here. Um, if you are interested in more information, we definitely have a Facebook group uh, available here at facebook.com slash groups slash COPD Navigator, or you can follow the, uh, the Facebook link at the bottom of the screen here uh, and uh, tap into the group that way also. That's kind of our main, uh, it's a new feature we're trying to uh, figure out how all that works with uh, pages and groups and all that stuff. Uh, also working uh, a lot easier to get things archived. Uh, this is not going to be in my finest hour, but uh, getting things archived onto YouTube here. Uh, I got a notification that with another 20 subscribers to YouTube, um, I get to actually uh, get a custom uh, address for the site. So that might be kind of nice instead of having all that uh, all that stuff down there. I'll be able to brand that one as COPD Navigator 2 and make it even easier to find some of our older videos uh, and uh, as this stuff gets archived, archived up there. Uh, upcoming, uh, we've got, uh, let's see, what is coming up with COPD Navigator? We do, uh, we do have these um, every week, uh, every Friday at noontime, Eastern, noon Eastern daylight time these days. Um, next week coming up is actually a very relevant one in my life. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, having the talk. Uh, not the traditional birds and the bees talk, but uh, one more important at this phase, uh, which is making sure that you have your wishes known uh, to your family members. This one is uh, kind of timely for me. Uh, we had to uh, postpone last week's uh, Navigator Live due to the passing of my grandmother. Uh, and as I've been working through some of that stuff over the last week, um, I have found some things that uh, as her durable power of attorney, I should have done better. Uh, to make sure that uh, we could have had a little bit smoother process as we uh, um, make some of these final arrangements. Uh, so I'm going to be sharing some of my experience and some of our best practice tips out there um, for making sure that uh, as, uh, uh, as things progress and as things as everybody gets later in life, uh, it's never too soon to start talking about what you want for uh, um, 
uh, for your your needs, your your desires, your comfort level. Uh, it's an awkward conversation in many cases, but it's a very necessary one uh, to have with your loved ones so that they understand. Um, also, uh, coming up in a couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about some of the surgical and uh, also some less invasive uh, options out there for COPD. Uh, we're going to come back to uh, the COPD Mythbusters talk that was scheduled for last week. Uh, and then as soon as possible after that, uh, coming up in April, we're also going to have another medication review. That's been a hot topic in the last couple of days uh, throughout our group. And we're going to talk about best practices for taking your inhalers, uh, best practices for figuring out what to speak to your clinician about to uh, make sure that you're medically optimized uh, as much as possible, uh, and some of, those, uh, some of those tips and tricks. So... Uh, it does look like we've got a couple of questions here. So we're going to be going on here. Uh, we're going to talk to Val, who has had a, a Valerie, excuse me, I shouldn't assume that you like nicknames. So uh, Valerie mentions that uh, I've had a chest infection since before Christmas. Yikes. Uh, it is gone now since last week, but struggling to breathe. Any idea what I can do? Um, well, first and foremost, uh, the, the easiest thing to do is what we call personal breathing. This is one of those things that is out there uh, when you don't have access to equipment, when you don't have access to machinery. Uh, this is one way where you can use your own body to kind of, uh, again, get some of those alveoli, those lung units back into the game and try to uh, improve, flush out some of the stale air in your body. Uh, and so letting you take in a, a bit of a deeper breath. Uh, and basically all you have to do, it's very simple, you take a breath in, you put your lips together like you're about to whistle, and you blow out. You'll notice it usually takes a lot more time than a usual exhalation, uh, and with uh, blowing out against those pursed lips, you're also delivering a little bit of back pressure down into the lung and making sure that uh, um, everything is opening up as much as possible. It's kind of like uh, uh, an uh, automatic or uh, body-oriented CPAP type of thing, uh, where you're getting some of that pressure level in there uh, and all that. Um, Another option is to use an external device. Uh, these kinds of devices are uh, fairly commonly used. Um, you can usually get one through uh, one of your providers, whether it's pulmonology office. Uh, sometimes they're available through a durable medical equipment provider. Uh, this one is called an acapella. This one is, uh, comes in a couple of different colors now these days. Uh, and this one is called an aerobica. They both work uh, very similarly. They give you a little bit of resistance. You can see through here, there's a little bit of a membrane in there. Uh, very similar on here, there's another membrane. Uh, and they also give you a little bit of vibration. Hopefully that comes through the microphone. Uh, the uh, vibration helps knock loose some of that phlegm that can uh, uh, pile up with chest infections. Um, and um, help clear out some of that stuff as well as giving you a little bit more of that uh, the effect the sim more but a similar effect to a personal breathing uh, where you get a little bit more of that lung recruitment and get some of that stuff going on um, also if you're having some str uh, struggles breathing you might again want to talk to your provider about uh, working with one of these non-invasive ventilators uh, it could be that you just need to kind of recondition those respiratory muscles on um, that whole uh, that whole setup in your chest uh, and these de those devices uh, that we talked about today the, the trilogy device from respironics and the uh, the, the uh, life 2000 niav device from from breathe technologies uh, they can both work to uh, to re reteach your your uh, respiratory muscles how to take a more effective breath and support that while you're still in that recovery from an extended uh, uh, infection and extended sick time. So um, those would be my recommendations off the top of the head to talk to your clinician about those, and uh, hopefully that can that can help you out. Elizabeth mentions, what does Dalaresp do? Is it worth the side effects? Uh, Dalaresp uh, was a brand name for a drug called Reflumalast, uh, which is technically an anti-inflammatory drug. It uh, works by preventing, uh, by inhibiting or stopping uh, um, a molecule called phosphodiesterase diesterase 4. Uh, so sometimes we see it called a, a PDE4 inhibitor. Uh, and basically what this does is it uh, works to reduce inflammation inside the lungs uh, like a steroid does, but through a different chemical process. 
uh, so you don't have the, the steroid side effects. What you do have uh, are a different set of side effects. Some people uh, obviously are stricken more by them than others. Um, it usually has uh, gastrointestinal stuff. A lot of people have upset stomachs or a lot of uh, stuff coming out one end or the other, uh, to put it as delicately as I can. Um, and so what we see is there are certainly people where the side effects are worth it and there are people where the side effects aren't worth it. Uh, it's really going to be one of those individual cases. Uh, for those people who benefit from it, uh, most of them agree that uh, the side effects uh, are worth it. But again, this is going to really depend on your individual case. So uh, let's see what's going on here. I apologize if the screen has frozen and the audio is still going on. Um, it's a little bit unclear what's going on on my end here, but we're going to keep on plugging away for a few more minutes. Uh, Tom asks what perfusion on the oximeter is. We talked a little bit earlier about um, these oximeters. And we can see, hopefully, if uh, the screen is still working here, uh, the very low end of the uh, the screen here on this particular device uh, gives us a little waveform pattern that talks about what your perfusion is. And it does seem like things have ground to a halt. So hopefully we fix that now. Um, so talking about perfusion, so we're going to take a look at that again. Um, when we talk about perfusion in the sense of uh, pulse oximetry and what we're talking about here, as uh, Tom was asking, um, we see on the bottom of this device is a little waveform graph that talks about the perfusion of my finger. What perfusion is, is how much blood is getting through uh, your, your blood supply. When things are well perfused and nice and pink, if I were to hold, uh, hold my finger there, it's going to turn white for a second. If you put a tourniquet on there, uh, or if you're a kid like me, you put those rubber bands on your finger until you kind of cut off some of that circulation, it turns white. When you have low perfusion, like when your finger is cold or when you've uh, cut off the blood flow somehow, uh, there is less blood for the, the sensor to detect. And so when you have a low perfusion state, um, the sensor is likely going to be a little less accurate. Uh, some of these new devices uh, are able to sense a little bit better as they get into those low perfusion states just uh, by using different wavelengths of light or different other uh, signal processing tricks out there. Um, but uh, the, the bottom line is the higher perfusion you have, the more accurate your reading is going to be. Uh, and the more reliable that number is going to be for whatever you're using it for. Um, so Janice, uh, talking to the pulmonologist about a trilogy uh, to cut down on exacerbation, I should um, clear out that, or I should clarify, I should say, um, there is a difference between the trilogy device and the Trelogy inhaler. That's a new one uh, on the market that has three medications in it, um, which also has some uh, indication to cut down on uh, exacerbation. So um, it's a little bit tricky here and there, but make sure that you're uh, you're talking about the right thing and uh, uh, making. Sure, but uh, they're they're both uh, solid in the right populations, and the Trilogy device uh, can definitely cut down on some of those uh, exacerbations. So. Hi Charles, thanks for joining us. Uh, even uh, a little bit late, but that's okay. Uh, if you are late or if you end up missing the show, we do get these up on YouTube, uh, usually within, uh, usually by the following Wednesday. Uh, so make sure you're checking out the uh, YouTube channel down below here and uh, um, see what you can do uh, to, to catch up on uh, some of the, the old episodes uh, and get everything situated for the, the next time around. Uh, Kathy has some user experience, a Trilogy for three years and have a difficult time using it. I uh, use it for severe tracheomalacia, which is a, a narrowing of the, the main airway. Uh, seems to keep the upper stomach sphincter open so that after an hour I feel very nauseated. Also fishes into my sinus cavity and seems to stir sinuses up causing an infection. Um, and that is, um, that's very true. I mean, in any, any therapy, um, is designed for the right person. I know that sounds kind of a, like a weird thing to say, but 
Um, COPD is not a one-size-fits-all solution. Uh, for many years, and even now, a lot of clinicians still try to shoehorn people into these particular boxes and say, well, this worked for patient X, uh, and so it should work for patient Y, and this is what we're going to do, and this is the standard of care and all that stuff. Uh, and what we should be looking at is that we have these recommendations, we have guidelines, we have strategies, we have all this stuff, but those really give us kind of a baseline idea of what we should be doing for someone. Um, what we actually should be doing for an individual strongly depends on what else is going on with that person's particular case, uh, whether they have other stuff going on. Sometimes therapy can be different if you have heart problems or uh, we're seeing now that therapy can be different if you have uh, reflux disease and things like that. Uh, and so the, the trilogy can be a very good device, but if you happen to be someone like Kathy, it's not maybe the best device for you. It can be effective, but sometimes that pressure can cause more problems than it solves. So it's very important to advocate for yourself and speak up loudly to your clinician. If you don't feel that something is working for you, find out what else is on the market that maybe you can adapt to. Uh, and you can try other things, whether it's medications, whether it's therapies, whether it's exercise programs, all that kind of stuff. Very important to, uh, to speak out and, uh, and be your own best advocate there. Um, the perfusion number scale. So Tom wants a little bit more clarification uh, about the perfusion number scale. And um, oh, that is particularly on, uh, that's a feature of this particular device, um, this, uh, this Massimo device, which we're going to get it to load up back here. And we see that it gives us a waveform and then it gives us this number here. And the number, the clinical relevance of this number, and we can see that I've been uh, waving my hands around, been talking a lot, and my blood flow is up a little bit higher. Uh, at least it was for a minute, now it's coming back down. Um, this number gives us kind of a relative indication of how well your, your perfusion is. It's not necessarily a hard and fast number uh, that you should worry about or that's going to be evaluated or anything else. Um, but it gives you some context to understand the other numbers that are involved there. Like if you have, um, if, you're, if your um, saturation is reading at say 94%, but your perfusion index is only down at like 0.9 or 1, that's an indication that your um, finger isn't being perfused very well. And so that number may not necessarily be accurate. Similarly, when um, fingers are cold or you have low perfusion, um, things tend to read a little bit low. So if you get, if you put your pulse oximeter on and it's reading 77%, but your perfusion index is very low, uh, instead of panicking and calling the 911 or throwing oxygen on or anything like that, uh, if you don't feel that you're, if you don't feel that short of breath, if you don't feel that problematic, Think for a minute about what might be causing that low perfusion. Is your finger cold? Did you just come in from uh, from outside and everything's kind of clamped down? Um, have you been moving your finger around a lot? Are you trying to take your, your reading while you are exercising? You've been waving your arms and you got a lot of motion problem, motion artifact. It's basically just kind of another fail safe to understand whether that number is reliable or not. If it's relatively high, um, up, you know, I've been getting numbers four, five, and six. I, I from the from the data I was looking at, the actual the, the extreme peak is somewhere around twenty, but I haven't. I, you don't see that very often. If you have a relatively high number, you know it's a fairly reliable saturation. If it's low, then maybe you need to second guess it a little bit. So, hopefully, that will clarify that out a little bit. Um, so I think we've, uh, we covered the trilogy versus trilogy very well. And that's, that's going to be, uh, that's kind of almost like a who's on first kind of thing, but, uh, uh, that's the way it goes in COPD. Sometimes everybody wants to have their own little trademark. So they find, uh, the, the smallest difference they can do and, uh, and get stuff out there. But, uh, uh, we've cleared a lot of that stuff up. Hopefully we cleared out the... <laughs> Uh, I don't know about that, Tom, but you're very welcome. Uh, hopefully we've cleared up some of that stuff. Hopefully we've answered some of your questions about non-invasive ventilation. Uh, I think we're going to wrap things up for the day. If anybody's got some last-minute questions that they want to throw out there, they're certainly welcome. Uh, but again, I'm going to encourage everybody to stop by uh, in a week or so uh, for talking about uh, making your wishes known. Um, we're going to be having some great talks uh, now in April. Um, I am going to be taking a couple weeks off, 
Um, we've got a spring break trip uh, planned coming up in a couple of weeks, and then the week after that is our State Respiratory Society uh, convention, or our, our annual conference, uh, where I'll be talking about uh, care coordination in, uh, in COPD and trying to, to solve a lot of the problems that we have with getting these devices to people, making sure everybody's on the same page uh, and everybody's uh, speaking the same language. Um, as I did last year, I hope to be able to live stream at least part of it. I hope to have a little bit of, uh, to, of insight from um, from the conference, especially now that we have a little bit more better tech set up, but uh, I don't want to promise anything and uh, that I can't deliver on. So uh, I'm going to be taking at least one and probably two weeks off coming up in, in April, but uh, then we're going to be getting back into the regular schedule, talking about all the fun stuff we like to talk about here in COPD Navigator Live. Uh, if you have suggestions for future talks, uh, please feel free to uh, comment uh, on this video or go to uh, facebook.com slash COPD Navigator and drop us a comment there uh, and uh, let us know what you'd like to hear. Uh, otherwise, I hope everybody has a great weekend. Enjoy St. Patrick's Day uh, safely and responsibly, of course. I uh, hope you take care of yourselves and take care of each other, and uh, we'll see you next week. Music